One June evening in 2013, two girls who had been visiting their relatives disappeared in the eastern Russian village of Sinsk. If you google the name of this tiny settlement, you'll immediately find news about this mysterious case, but not much else. Sinsk, however, is not your ordinary village. It is flanked by deep forests on one side and a tributary of Russia's third largest river, Lena, on the other, and can only be reached by boat or helicopter. And while boats were a commonplace for the villagers, a helicopter ride would hardly have been affordable for anyone. Sinsk is located in the Republic of Saha, Yakutia, Russia's largest region. It was to these parts that the famed Georgian revolutionary and future Soviet politician Sergo Argenikidze was sent into exile in the early 20th century. Upon entering Sinsk, you will see a wooden signpost with the word Sin, the name of the village in the Yakut language. It's registered as an Aslak, the region's smallest territorial unit. In 2020, its official population was 853, but the locals say that the real figure is even smaller. The village is practically cut off from the rest of the world, a small and secluded settlement. It's almost impossible for a stranger to appear in it unnoticed. All the villagers know each other. It was from this remote hamlet that two young girls, Alina and Ayana, disappeared in 2013. Strange things started happening in sinks during the investigation into their disappearance. Let's delve into this mysterious case together. Ayana Vinakurova came to visit her grandparents in early June of 2013. The parents of Alina Ivanova couldn't find a kindergarten for their child and decided to send her to her grandmother for at least a couple of weeks. At the time of their disappearance, both girls were only three years old. The two weren't related in any way. It just so happened that the grandparents lived almost next door to each other, so the girls quickly became friends and started spending all their free time together. They played either in front of the Vinokurov house or the Ivanov house, with grandparents watching over them. Initially, they were always under adult supervision. Several weeks after their arrival, on June 24th, the girls were playing not far from the Ivanov house. Alina's grandmother, Olga, left the house at 5.30 p.m and her husband, Gavriel Nikolaevich, was left to look after the children. After nearly two hours at 7.15 p.m., the girls were still playing, but next to the house of a neighboring boy. At 7.45 p.m., Alina's grandfather called his wife to say he was leaving for work and that the girls were still playing in the street. In a quarter of an hour at 8 p.m., Olga returned home and called out for Alina and her friend Ayana, but no one responded. Olga went over to Ayana's house. The girls weren't outside of it. Panicked, Olga knocked on the door of the house, but children weren't inside either. Grandparents of both girls decided to start the search themselves, with help from acquaintances. The search was made difficult by the fact that no one knew exactly where they were last seen. Presumably, they had played near the house of the neighboring boy till 7.30. However, another version states that they were last seen at about 7.10. Another witness will later say he saw Elena's grandmother returning home shortly after 7 p.m., not at 8. Yet, none of the locals had seen the girls talking to strangers or going anywhere together. It was like they had vanished into thin air. After conducting a short search on their own, the families asked the head of the village, Sergei Logina, for help. Thanks to him, hundreds of villagers joined the search. At this point, 
five hours had passed since Olga Ivanova had noticed her granddaughter's disappearance. Sergei Loganov called the police and the rescue service as per instruction. According to official data, the police were informed of the girl's disappearance at around 1 a.m. on June 25th. The rescue service, the head of the village, and a number of its inhabitants assumed that the children most likely went into the woods and got lost. The possibility of them drowning in Senia River was also discussed. However, these versions seemed flawed. Why would children who never went away farther than their backyard and were always watched over by adults suddenly decide to go into the forest? Keep in mind also that the search for them started almost immediately. If they had been in the forest, they would have most likely been found very quickly, seeing as three-year-olds wouldn't make it far through the deep woods around the village in only 15 minutes. Besides, in order to reach the woods, they would have had to walk along the streets of the village and thus would have most likely been seen by at least somebody. Nonetheless, the official search started in the morning, with combing through the forest. Each foot of forest in the radius of 20 to 25 miles around Sinsk was scoured. The mission in the forest lasted for over 10 days and involved around 300 people. The volunteers were joined by sniffer dogs, hydrocopters, boats, and drones with thermal imaging. However, the operation was rather poorly coordinated. To find a missing person in the forest, you need to move slowly, in a line, and the teams need radios, flashlights, good shoes, and food. In reality, however, you had badly prepared people wandering chaotically through the forest in search of any traces of the girls. Volunteers and rescuers wasted time and energy exploring hard-to-reach places that three-year-olds couldn't have gotten to. Divers searched for Elena and Ayana in the river, but their efforts were also in vain. Since this search yielded no results, the police started looking into versions that could have involved other people. Perhaps the girls were kidnapped and taken away from the village. While investigating this possibility, the police started suspecting the owners of two boats that had left the village on June 24th. However, the thought that the children may have never left the village was not discarded. Virtually all of the villagers became suspects. All men aged 14 to 70 were checked in case they had ever shown an unhealthy interest in kids. Even adolescents were interrogated. Many of the boys returned home from the police station frightened and in tears. The methods of the police bordered on torture. The villagers, even those of school age, were threatened and beaten, leading many to nearly confess to something they hadn't done. Among others, this was the case for Elena's grandfather, Gavril Nikolaevich. According to rumors, he was taken out into the forest and threatened with a knife so that he would confess. This approach resulted in Gavril Ivanov saying he had run the girls over in his car and buried them in the forest. Though there was no evidence for this, he randomly showed a spot in the forest where the police naturally didn't find anything. Having been beaten several more times, he nonetheless found in himself the strength to retract his false confession, insisting that it was given under pressure. Both his wife and son had previously reported the atrocious questioning methods applied to him, and even a picture of Gavril Nikolaevich beaten up after yet another interrogation was leaked into the internet. Meanwhile, the tensions in Sinsk were growing. The locals slandered each other in a frantic attempt to find the perpetrators. The most innocuous things were deemed suspicious. Someone had put up a swing in his backyard, surely to lure in the girls, or burn something in a kiln on the day of the girl's disappearance. One man was proclaimed a suspect for having blood on his jacket, but it later turned out to be cow blood. 
the villagers stopped trusting each other and even themselves. After interrogations, the more impressionable would doubt their own memory. Perhaps it was them who kidnapped the girls. All the buildings were searched with the help of sniffer dogs, though these were trained to find living people, and it's not clear whether they could search for bodies. Even houses in the neighboring villages were examined, but nothing relating to the case was found. Cars were checked. Everyone who had left Sinsk by boat was investigated, also to no avail. Something else was found, however. The search in the forest uncovered a graveyard of dead dogs and sacks. This was rumored to be the work of one of the locals, but he was never found. All 380 houses in Sinsk were searched twice. Abandoned areas and locked premises also drew attention of the investigators. The search was a large-scale but chaotic one, which led to some believing it was a simply way of showing the locals that the police had done their job and don't know what to do. Igor Borisov, the head of the Saha Republic at the time, promised a million rubles or $14,000 for information about the missing girls, a huge sum by village standards, but this also didn't help the case. Later, on a small islet in a river branch, locals found a child's dress, but the relatives of the missing girls didn't recognize it. Besides, it obviously hadn't been there for long. The sun hadn't yet faded the colors, and no one had noticed it previously, though the islet had been searched several times. Then, a strange letter was sent to Olga Ivanova from some religious organization. Its text was written as a poem and spoke of Yahuach, the Yikud New Year, the summer, good weather, and the disappearance of children. The letter was handed over to the Russian investigative committee, but it didn't help answer the question of where the girls were. Meanwhile, strange things continued happening in Sinsk. One example is the story of Vasily Latyshev. The villager was very worried about the fate of the girls because he himself had a daughter and was generally a rather emotional person. On that ill-fated day, he had driven his tractor along the street that Alina and Ayana disappeared from, and this made him a suspect, though another version of events states he was only called in as a witness. On the 9th of May 2014, he was found hanged in the barn with a knife wound to his heart. Locals say he was also accused of killing the girls by a psychic. Yes, a psychic had participated in the search operation, and it was after his words that Vasily fell into depression. Vasily wasn't the only one to lose his life soon after the incident. Alina's grandparents reported neighbor after neighbor to the police, suspecting pretty much everybody. Gavril Nikolaevich allegedly recounted that Ayana's grandfather, Anatoly Prokopiev, came to their house at night and, brandishing a knife, insisted on helping him take out two bags. Olga Pavlovna was beside herself with worry for her granddaughter and fell ill. She passed away in 2015. It was said she never even talked to her husband, Gavril, after the girl's disappearance. They allegedly communicated by exchanging notes that were then burnt. By the way, neither of them ever had to answer for their libel against neighbors. A dark shadow fell over Sinsk. People started leaving the village. The growing feeling of unease was fueled by the fact that according to some witnesses, Alina had wanted to return home and was to be taken back to her parents in Yakutsk on June 24th. For some unknown reason, the trip was cancelled. Alongside Alina's grandfather and several neighbors, the police had another official suspect, a young man who was driving an off-road vehicle through the village that evening. When the police called on him, they were met by the young man's father who let them examine the car, which was freshly washed 
and had new tires. Therefore, the police couldn't find any evidence to support the theory that the man may have run the girls over. And that's all that is known about this suspect. Yet another suspect was pointed out by a Kazakh psychic named Medina. She spoke of a young man, 19 to 20 years old, who was mentally challenged and used notes to communicate with his mother. These notes were later found. The mother had written to him about the disappearance of Alina, adding, let's go feed the girls, they're probably hungry. The young man decided that the volunteers were calling for help and took with him a halved apple. This was also deemed suspicious. Time went by, and after about a year the case started going cold, hope that there might still be justice for Alina and Ayana was rekindled when Dmitry Kiruhin, an investigator from St. Petersburg, arrived in Sinsk. He used the criminal profiling system developed in the FBI, which you might know about from this Netflix series called Mindhunter. Kiruhin was scheduled to go to Sinsk during the active search phase, but for some reason he was delayed and only arrived in the village a year later. Dmitri suggested from the very start that the girls were killed. He believed that there was likely a pedophile maniac on the loose and created a profile of the presumed criminal. According to him, this person would have an unhealthy interest in children but at the same time seemed benevolent, so much so that children would be drawn to him. He would have been living in Sinsk for a long time, perhaps even next door to the Ivanov and Vernikurov families. Kiruhin didn't believe that Gavriel Ivanov had killed the girls, but he didn't rule out his involvement in the case, suggesting that perhaps the grandfather was covering up for some other relatives. The profiler stressed, every villager can be suspected, even the nicest ones. Once the news of the girl's disappearance broke and active searching began, the culprit would have come up with an alibi, but nevertheless taken part in the search so as not to raise suspicion among the other villagers. He would have to have a good hideout where no one could find the girls. He would also likely have had mental issues, said Kiruhin. Vasily Latyshev, the girl's neighbor, matched the description. The locals described him as a kind and sympathetic person. He was one of the first to go search, however, as we know, Latyshev hanged himself soon after the first accusations against him. Interestingly enough, Kiruhin dismissed the idea that the girl's disappearance had to do with a car accident. All the vehicles in the village had been examined, and no one ever drove faster than about 12 miles per hour on the village streets. Dmitri also noted that precious time was lost because of the large-scale search in the forest. He believed the search should have immediately started in the village. This miscalculation, according to him, was the reason why the culprit still hadn't been found. But despite all his quite sensible assumptions, Kiruhin, who was considered a professional and had caught a number of maniacs and kidnappers, failed to solve the Singh's case and was sent back to St. Petersburg. Incidentally, many people in Sinsk were not happy with his theories. As I've already mentioned, psychics were involved in the case. Five mages came to Sinsk, several more contacted the girl's relatives by phone. And all of them said the same thing. The children are alive, but are being held against their will. This gave the relatives hope. In the meantime, the locals started preferring even more mystical versions of events. They suggested aliens astral portals in the forest, and other such fanciful things, none of which can be confirmed by evidence. The police had searched several houses on tips from the psychics, but all their leads turned out to be useless. There also existed the theory that the girls were kidnapped for the organ trade, but there is no evidence for this, and besides, one of the girls had a heart condition. 
Another version involves a secret cellar that the police failed to find. After all, there are dozens of famous cases where captured people were kept almost in plain sight and yet went unnoticed for many years. And what about the locals? Which version do they believe? Many residents of Sinsk think that Alina's grandfather was involved. They find this version plausible because Gavril had often changed his testimony, but there was no actual evidence against him. People also found suspicious that in the fall of 2013, the Ivanov family moved into the house of their relatives in the next street. Some said that the grandparents themselves never went into the forest to search for the children, but started gathering money the day after their disappearance. When the interrogation started, Olga went to the hospital, yet no one knew what she was sick with. She was, however, definitely ill and passed away two years after the tragedy. Her funeral was held on June 24th, the day of the girl's disappearance. Gavril worked at the local school for a while, nothing else is known about him since. Because the missing persons were minors, a criminal case was opened in order to engage as many resources as possible for the search operation. The possibility that the girls were murdered by someone in Sinsk had been actively discussed among the villagers. Detective Kiruhin also found it plausible, pointing out that no traces of the girls were found in the forest and the river. He thought it likely that one of the villagers kidnapped and killed the children. After the parents of the missing girl sent complaints to the head of the Russian investigative committee, Alexander Bastrykin, detectives from Moscow arrived in Sinsk. Now, after many years, the case is being investigated once more by top specialists in the field. Now we can only wait and hope that an explanation for the disappearance of Alina Ivanova and Ayana Vinokurova will finally be found. Which version do you consider the most plausible? What's the strangest part of the story? Should we still hope to solve the case and find the girls alive? Please share your thoughts in the comments, subscribe, and tune in next week for another story.